Welcome to Evil Done Badly, the worst true crime podcast on the internet. We've got a crazy case for you this week, and you've probably already heard about it from better podcasters than me, but I'm going to take a crack at it anyways. We've never claimed to be original or good. We are called Evil Done Badly after all. But this week, we're covering the murder of Jaina Murray in Bethesda, Maryland. It's a grisly, mind-blowing case that occurred on March 11th, 2011, and has since been known as the Lulu Lemon Murder. But before we get into the bloody details, grab yourself a beverage, hold on to your arse, and let's hear the theme song. <laughs> This episode of Evil Done Badly is sponsored by... Nobody. We're currently looking for a sponsor to fill in this empty space. If you would like your commercial to be heard by up to... Three fervent listeners every week, contact our advertising department by email at... EvilDoneBadly at gmail.com And let's talk some business. Or just be a cunt and ignore us like everyone else. And don't blame us when your company goes bing right down the toilet. And if you're still not a member of the Wide World of Paranormal Investigations group on Facebook, what are you waiting for? Now back to the show. On the morning of March 12, 2011, a manager was getting ready to start their day at the local Maryland Lululemon store and unlock the front door to make their way inside. Or at least, that was the plan. See, the front door was already unlocked, which is not a normal thing for the door to a retail store to be first thing in the morning. And when she got inside, there was a scene of pure, destructive chaos and moaning coming from the back hall. Merchandise was flung all over the place, the mannequins were knocked over, and there were bloody footprints scattered all over the floor. This is quite the scene, man. This is fucking bonkers. The manager was, understandably, scared completely shitless, and went outside to get help. She found a dude, and made him go inside and look around. The guy found employee Jaina Murray face down in a blood puddle and dead with many multiple wounds and the crotch of her pants cut out. He also found Brittany Norwood, another employee, with her wrists and ankles bound with zip ties and with multiple wounds and blood on her face. She was the one doing the moaning. This is totally fucked up and makes you wonder what kind of people are capable of such carnage. These are fucking cunts if there ever was cunts. Well, according to Brittany, these cunts followed the two of them into the store the previous night. Brittany and Jaina had been working the closing shift. They said goodbye and left the store at 9.45 p.m. Brittany had accidentally left her keys inside the store and had to call Jaina to meet her back at the store to let her in to retrieve them. The two of them meet back at the store and go inside around 10.05 to find the keys. But holy shit! All of a sudden, two masked men snuck in behind them and started doing very conscious things to them. These bastards would go on to rape them, stab them, and they would use racial slurs when referring to Brittany, because she's black, and not towards Gina, because she's white. These two fuckers decided to murder Gina and stabbed her over 300 times. Again, according to Brittany... They let Brittany live because they found her more fun to have sex with. 
despite them referring to her with racial slurs. She's just that sexy. So what these cunts did, they just tied her up, cut her a few times, raped her, and left her moaning in the bathroom before running off into the night. Now this whole story is fucking tragic. These bastards must be stopped. What's wrong with these cunty fuckers? So the police interview Brittany, who is understandably shook up. I mean, she's been through a lot. With all the raping and cutting people up and all, the police are eager to start investigating and get the fuckers who did this. That's good police work. The police started asking around to the local stores, wondering if anyone had recently bought any ski masks and they also went looking for Jaina's missing car. Her car was found three blocks away at a farmer's market, with blood inside and on the door handles. So, it looks like these fuckers are robbing, raping, using inappropriate language, murdering, and misusing people's automobiles, and are, well, no closer to being caught. It looks like someone is going to get away with a brutal rape and murder. Fucking cunts. Now, they bring Brittany in to interview her again. This is after she's had some time to recover and get her thoughts together. She gives a description of the guys who did it, and the police immediately set out to look for suspicious people wearing ski masks. I guess they found someone wearing one, and the police start tailing this guy. Obviously, this suspicious guy is in the habit of wearing a ski mask in the carrying out of his daily activities and was just walking around the mall with it on. Either way, the cops found him suspicious, and they decided to follow him around for a bit, and it didn't lead them anywhere. Obviously, this suspicious guy led them somewhere. I mean, he wasn't just standing there all day. But wherever he went, it didn't yield any useful information at all. The police talked to the person who worked at the Apple store next door. Seems like a nice place to start. And this person said that they heard some commotion coming from the Lululemon shop on the night of the murder. This commotion involved women arguing, someone screaming, people being hit and or dragged, and someone whimpering, quote, God help me, end quote. So naturally, this employee, uh, just kind of shrugged it off and went about closing up the Apple store as if everything was normal. Um, all right. Uh, you could have played that a little better there, sir. So, the police go on about their investigating. I mean, they are inquisitive little bastards. And when they look into it, they find that it's extremely unlikely that poor dead Jaina was actually sexually assaulted. That's weird. And I mean, I'm pretty sure in 2011, forensics were far enough along to be able to tell if someone was raped or not. So something about this rape is a bit screwy. And it's not quite adding up. About a week later, they uh, ask Brittany again, if she knows anything about the whereabouts of Jaina's car. And she says something like, Nope, never saw it. No idea what you're talking about. Now, the cops find this peculiar because they know that the car has blood on it and they've looked into the blood and they've studied it a bit and they've come to the conclusion that this blood just happens to belong to Jaina and Brittany. So Brittany's own blood is on Jaina's abandoned car. 
despite her saying she knows nothing about this abandoned car. So she's put on the spot, and uh, she kind of backpedals a bit and says something to the effect of, Oh yeah, I took it, and I dropped it off at the farmer's market. The bad guys in the masks made me do it, and they told me they'd kill me if I wasn't back in ten minutes. I neglected to mention that fact before, but I'm mentioning it now because you've brought it up and it's now relevant. So what she's saying here is she had to take Jaina's car to the farmer's market and park it, or else these bad guys were going to kill her. She was afraid for her life and doing the only reasonable thing. I mean, she's been through so much. You can't expect her to get bogged down in the details of such a traumatic, traumatizing event. My God, the humanity. Leave poor Brittany alone, you mean old police officers. Hasn't Brittany been through enough? Well, no. She's a cunt and deserves to be impaled on a hot stick for eternity. See, all that stuff I told you earlier, that was complete horse shit. I didn't make it up, but someone else did, which still makes it horse shit. I can't take credit for it, but you've already figured that out. Or you are so bright that you know that it's all horse shit, and you probably already heard this story from someone else anyway. Far more competent podcasters have covered this one till the end of time. But it's just so not so that I wanted to cover it too. So let's get on with what's really going on here. Now, Jaina and Brittany leave Lululemon at 9.45 p.m. and return to get Brittany's keys at 10.05 p.m. Now, that part is not quite horse shit. The forgotten key business was horse shit, and that was just a ruse for Brittany to get Jaina alone back in the store after hours. Then, once they're back in the store alone, holy fucking shit fuck, Brittany goes ape shit. She attacks Jaina with at least five different weapons, including knives and a hammer. At least 331 different wounds were recorded on Jaina's body. That is one hell of a crime of passion. Brittany loses her fucking mind and absolutely annihilates poor Jaina. Now, this annihilation was the commotion that the Apple guy heard next door. Knowing what we know now, I hope he feels like a bit of a tit nowadays. Brittany loses her mind, but she keeps it together long enough to try and stage the scene to look like a burglary and made up the story about the dudes in the ski masks. After Jaina was dead, Brittany cut the crotch out of her pants to make it look like she was sexually assaulted. She knocked over a bunch of stuff in the store and tracked bloody footprints all over the floor to make it look like dudes were walking around in there with blood on their feet. Brittany then jumped in Jaina's car, drove it down the road and parked it, and in the process, got both of their blood on the inside and outside of it. So, she went through a fuckload of trouble to try and throw off the authorities, including tying herself up, inflicting minor superficial wounds on herself, and making it look like she was assaulted. Now, there's not one thing about this story that doesn't sound fishy. My favorite part of this pathetic scam is that the bloody footprints found in the store were linked back to a pair of men's size 14 Reeboks that were found still inside the store in part of their inventory. And the other prints were matched to Norwood's own shoes. She walked around with her own shoes on then put on the men's shoes and walked around with those on and the bloody men's shoes got put back in a bucket in the store. So these bloody footprints are going around inside the store and they never leave. 
So that that just looks fucking stupid too. Now it wouldn't have surprised me if she had only used like the left shoe to make these imprints. That that would have been the only thing to make it even stupider. Now she's not getting away with this. Christ, it's too fucking wacky to be believable. And just trying to set up something this nutty is, I mean, uh, there's going to be so many holes in this. It's just unbelievable that someone believed they could get away with this. So, she gets arrested about a week later on account of her being completely full of shit and a total dunderheaded psychopath. She's found guilty of first degree murder and sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. Score! Yes, great. Now, I mean, it's not the death penalty, but it's close, and it's well-deserved. But you might be asking yourself, what the ever-loving fuck drove Brittany to this madness in the first place? Well, the story goes like this. When Brittany and Jaina were getting ready to close up shop for the night on March 11th, they went through the routine practice of making sure each of them wasn't robbing the place on the way out. Now this involves looking in each other's book bags to make sure there's no merchandise in there. It turns out Brittany had stashed a pair of yoga pants in her bag and she had absolutely no intention of paying for them. So Jaina, being the good employee that she is, she calls her out on it. And after Brittany leaves, Jaina would call the manager at home and tell her about it. The manager says, they'll deal with it in the morning and you should go home for the night. So Jaina locks up and heads home. Somewhere in the next 20 minutes, Brittany dreams up this crazy plan to forget her imaginary keys, get Jaina alone in the store, and kill her over these pilfered pants. Holy fucking shit. What kind of unstable is this? This is a whole new level. Now, I've been thinking, and one thing I don't get about this checking co-workers' bags on the way out thing is, sure, if only one of the workers is a sketchy thief, that could act as a bit of a deterrent because one of them might turn the other one in. But what if they're both sketchy lowlifes. Couldn't they team up and cover for each other and just walk out of there with their bags full of crap every single night? Am I missing something here? Well, I don't know. I'd be a shitty thief, and I've been a shitty retail worker, so uh, I'm unqualified to talk about any of that. This is an unbelievable story, and I've heard it from a few different places now, and I'm sure it's got to be at least mostly true. Either way, the death of Jaina Murray is a goddamn tragedy and was 100% unnecessary. Brittany Norwood, you're a cunt, and whatever you're going through right now in prison is way too good for you. That's it for the episode. So, uh, we've got time here for a couple of listener questions, and, uh... Let's get started. PD Plinko Popper asks, What is your favorite brand of yoga pants? Well, PD, I only own one pair of yoga pants, and oddly enough, they are from Lululemon. I've had them forever. They have multiple holes in them by now, and I still wear them a couple of times a week. They really accentuate my curves, and I feel beautiful in them. They're worth every penny. Thanks for writing in. Next question. Sweaty Betty asks, Hey, our yoga pants are better than Lululemon's. Go buy them right now and feel the difference. Uh, thanks for writing in, Betty, but uh, you must be mistaking us for a podcast with a budget. We have no money for extra pants. I'll be wearing the one pair that I do have until the arse falls out of them. That is... Unless you would like to sponsor us and send us a free pair for us to review. In which case, hook us up. I'll take a small man's in pink. Thanks for writing in, sweaty. And there you have it. Another crappy episode of the worst true crime podcast in history. 
Evil Done Badly is in the books. If you would like to reach out and suggest future episode topics, we can be reached on Twitter or Instagram at Evil Done Badly or by email at EvilDoneBadly at gmail.com. And if you would like to support the show, you can check out the Evil Done Badly True Crime Compendium Volume 1 book over on Amazon. It's like the podcast, but without you having to hear my annoying voice. It's available for free on Kindle Unlimited or available to purchase as an ebook or paperback. It's just as incompetent as our regular work, so don't expect any miracles or good grammar or anything like that. Anyways, thanks for listening. My name is Dick, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye. I'd just like to add in here that there's a quick update to the uh, Paul Bernardo case. Uh, When we covered Paul Bernardo, uh, we said that we wished he'd be boiled alive and fed to hungry lizards. Well, uh, that's not exactly what's happening. He's uh, currently being transferred from Millhaven Maximum Security Prison down to a medium security prison in Quebec. I don't know how anybody came up with the idea that that was a good thing to do, but somebody did, and the families are understandably a little worked up over it. And uh, he's a cunt, and he should either be, you know, like, have uh, a pile of blocks tied to him and thrown over the side of a ship, or he should be, uh, I don't know, sawn in half or something like that. But uh, no, he's being moved to a less secure facility in Quebec. And uh, as far as I can tell, he's eligible for parole again sometime late in 2023. Uh, I have no idea how our, our criminal system works here in Canada, but that all seems kind of backwards. Anyways, I just thought I'd fill you in, and uh, Paul is uh, being treated way too well for being the cunt that he is. So thanks again, and I'll see you next time.